It's ten times the terror. Hello and welcome to Ten Times the Terror. <laughs> Not okay. Hello and welcome to Ten Times the Terror. This is Paul and Gwen is with me here, and we're very pleased to have as a special guest uh, Kate McCarthy, who uh, was married to the late Kevin McCarthy, known to many fans as the star of the science fiction classic Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And Kate, we definitely want to talk about that film, but. Before we get into that, we want to hear a little bit more about you and, and Kevin. Um, just tell us a little bit more about yourself. Well, I grew up in Nutley, New Jersey, and um, left pretty quickly um, to go to college when I was 17. And uh, I was up in Boston for a while, and then it came to New York City. I, I always wanted to live in New York. I could see the Empire State Building's um, lights that would go back and forth from my bedroom window in Nutley. So it was this glamorous um, city that I always wanted to go and and live in. So that's what I did when I was about 23, I think. Um, and that's where I met Kevin. Um, and it was a very, well, it was, it, at that point, I was taking courses. I wanted to be a doctor, and so I had to go back to school and take my pre-med classes. And um, that's what I was doing when a friend called me up on New Year's Day of 1977 and said, I've got some theater tickets. You want to go? And I said, sure. Why not? Um, and so we went to the theater and it was just the most magical experience for me. And I completely fell in love with Kevin. Um, it was a very odd play. It was called Poor Murderer by Pavel Kohut, who was Czech, I believe, and or Czechoslovakian in those days. And um, it, it was a great, great part for Kevin. He He got to play everything from a dog braying to Hamlet to Polonius to, you know, having an episode where he's, um, it's a great scene where he gets down with these gypsies and is drinking and celebrating and he gives his wife's wedding ring away. And he was just absolutely magnificent. Um, and afterwards, I wanted to take my friend for, to have a drink somewhere and we couldn't really find anywhere to go. A lot of places were closed. And then I thought of Sardi's. So we walked over to Sardi's. And um, at some point, we, we couldn't afford to really eat a proper dinner. So we sat at the bar and drank Brandy Alexander's and <laughs> ate. Ritz crackers and whisk pride. <laughs> that was our dinner. Um, and suddenly I looked up and there was Kevin. And without even thinking about it, and I wasn't one to do this, I hopped off my bar stool and went over and spoke to him. And he was so nice and so wonderful and so. Um, charming really that and anybody who knew Kevin would say that he was very charming and then he left and I went back to my friend and said I can't let that man get away and she, <laughs> my exact <laughs> words <laughs> and she said to me well why don't you go home and write him a letter so that's what I did 
And I had no idea where to send it. So I sent it to the theater. And if Kevin were alive, this is where he would come in to tell his end of the story. Um, It was pretty remarkable because I, what I also didn't realize was that the play was closing the next day. And um, when I said goodbye to Kevin in Sardis, he had a bottle of champagne under his arm and he got on his, it was bitter, bitter cold. And he, his bike was chained up outside and he got on his bike and rode through the icy encrusted streets of Manhattan back to his apartment with Mm. his bottle of champagne. But uh, he did get the letter. Somebody took it upon themselves to forward it to him. And about two weeks later, a little, little bit more than that, he gave me a call and uh, I was having friends over for dinner and was just absolutely astonished. The first thing he said to me was, you write one hell of a letter, <laughs> which <laughs> that was nice to hear, but I was still, you know, I was so, I was kind of terrified and I had this sense of, oh my God, what have I done? And that we talked for a good long time um, and my friends were, you know, just sitting at the table waiting for me to tell them what was going on. And, uh, but we talked about Cape Cod because he was about to go up to Cape Cod with his son to work on a screenplay. Um, and I have a very long history with Cape Cod. I've been coming here since I was one or maybe even younger, six months old. Mm. And this is where my parents honeymooned. And oddly enough, this is where Kevin and his first wife honeymooned. So we had, you know, plenty to talk to about, talk to each other about that and other things. And then he asked me to meet him the following Friday. So we went out on this pretty much a blind date. And it was an incredible blind date because it was a party for Sean O'Casey's widow, who was an amazing woman. And uh, it was in a beautiful West Side, like Riverside Drive apartment, pre-war, just Mm. beautiful, big apartment. And um, I had a great time, had an absolutely wonderful time. And after that, we went to the Russian Tea Room, which was also wonderful. And that's how we started to get to know each other. And it was so bizarre because we had this great affinity for each other, but but also this great age difference. He was 37 years older than I was. So that was you know, so he was older even than my father, and I was younger than his oldest son. So, you know, that's, you know, that's been an issue, but we had a terrific marriage, and it was absolutely the right thing to do for both of us. So, um, well, that's a great story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then we were together for 33 years. So it's, you know, it's a long-term marriage. Yeah. Well, if we can shift gears here, we do have to bring up the, uh, the elephant in the room uh, in the sense of um, uh, the film of Invasion of the Body Snatchers, an absolute science fiction classic. Now, was he aware of how, how hugely popular and influential that film was when you first, uh, first got Oh, happy? absolutely. Absolutely. And, um, you know, because people wrote him fan letters and, you know, wanted or sent him pictures and wanted, you know, of him and Invasion of the Body Snatchers asking for an autograph. Um, So, yeah, absolutely. That was that was always, you know, a big sort of 
piece of his past, along with other wonderful movies that he did, like um, Death of a Salesman, for sure. which he was nominated for an Academy <laughs> Award for Best Supporting Actor. So, yeah, absolutely. And at the time that it was made, I don't think he or anybody had a sense of what it would become, that it would be this incredible cult favorite and uh, would have such, a, you know, such longevity. People still love the original. Yeah, it's been refilmed twice, um, but nothing matches the original. No, I think it's been made three times. I think the last one, and Kevin had a cameo in the um, Philip Kaufman version. Right, the back in the 70s. Yes, with um, Leonard Nimoy, Donald Sutherland. It? Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. And that happened totally by happenstance. He happened to be in California in the office building for something else. And he just was walking down the hall, and I guess he passed Philip Coffin's office, and who came out into the hallway and said, "Hey, Kev, I've got a great idea," and that's how that happened. But um, the original, I think, is the best. There, I think there was a third one made with um, Nicole Kidman, which, to tell you the truth, I could, I don't think I could watch it. I, I never. I yeah, turned I, it I, off. I saw after it. A little it, while. it was not uh, not classic material. No. <laughs> uh, it only no. really made you long more for the original. <laughs> yes, and the original part of what's so great about it is it leaves so much to the imagination. And there, you know, there were very, very primitive effects. Nothing like what they had. Excuse me, technologically. In the 70s, when they were able to do, you know, redo it. And it was also one of the things I remember Kevin talking about was how sore his legs were from doing all that running up and down and up and down and all over the place. And then they were showing it at the Academy in Beverly Hills, the Academy Theater and which is this wonderful theater with this huge screen. And we were, we all went to see it. Um, we all, by which I mean, uh, Kevin means some of our children, some of his children from his first marriage. And it was amazing because we got to see Donna Winter doing the same amount of running up and down all over the place, but she was in high heels. Right. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just um, incredible to see that. One of the big discussions that goes on is about the, the ending of the film. And uh, yep. ostensibly it, the original, uh, and you know, Don Siegel went on to, who directed that, went on to do the Dirty Harry movies and you know, a lot of well-known films. Oh, afterwards. tons, yeah. But um, oh, yeah. you know, apparently the original ending was with um, you know Kevin as Miles. He's in out on the in the middle of a high, highway and, and he's shouting out, "You'll be next!" You know, and right. um, that was apparently the they're original here. Ending. You're next. And then they added, yeah. they changed it, they added, they added another ending which was much more hopeful, where um, they find the pods and they realize that he's, his story is true and so on and so forth. Did how did he feel about about that? Uh, did he ever talk about the um, you know, the, the yes. oh, oh, sure. Well, I I don't think he was that much in favor of it artistically, partly also because of the way that um, the book that it was based on ends. Uh, I think it was by Jack Stinney. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so he really thought that it should end the way it ended, but the studio, I think it was Warner Brothers, uh, felt it was too negative. And so they wanted a happier ending. They wanted the pods to be, you know, found chased out. away, yeah. found yeah, out, right. chased away, the armies coming, you know, whatever it takes, they were going to be saved. And so, but on the other hand, he had already gone home. He had to go back out to California. Home for him in those days was 
New York. And, and I think by that point, he was up in Dobbs Ferry, New York. And so, you know, it was another few days of work or maybe just one day of work. And and um, and that's always nice because it would have meant a little more pay. Um, and he had three kids that he was raising. So I, I from that point of view, he didn't object, but he he did like the original ending better. Mm. I have to uh, say that I understand the, the uh, how it frames out and so forth, but I, I really do like the, the the added ending. I like the <laughs> the hopeful part. Mm-hmm. They do they they do find out that you know the pods are are not an imaginary thing; they're real and so on and so forth. But right, uh, I, it, it certainly in its own t- look back historically, you have to think of this in the light of the McCarthy era and. House on American Activities and all of that stuff that was going on uh, at, the, right. uh, at that time, it really, you know, it, it, it's not just an escapist film. It's a film with insight into its own period. And in a very interesting way, in that it wasn't, they weren't conscious that they were making a film that had any of the, that resonance that you're, that you're talking about of, of the age. They were just making, you know, a B movie. Um, they didn't think that this was, oh, it must be a comment on communists taking over. And they had no no understanding of that at all, which is interesting. Well, it, it, because it was in the atmosphere when it was film was being made. So I think it, it just they just sort of imbibed that, if you will. You know, it's really replacing yeah, this period. Absolutely. Without any overt sort of intention of making that that particular movie yeah so. I, I have to mention what i t- talked to you on the phone about kate that uh i i've been a fan of horror science fiction fantasy films my whole life and i think the the at the point where i i'm rarely scared by anything it's yeah you know, kind of i haven't seen it all but i've seen an awful lot you know there are those few moments that are really really can shake you up no matter how many times you've seen them and from my perspective, the scariest scene in all of movie history is in Invasion <laughs> of the Body Snatchers. And it's the scene where, uh, you know, Kevin, as, as Miles, is leaving uh, uh, Becky, uh, uh, or, you know, Dana, Dana Whitener, looking for a way out of this tunnel. And he says to her, whatever you do, don't fall asleep, because when you fall asleep is when the pods take over. Right. And he comes back, and uh, she looks like she's dozing. He just shakes her, shakes her. And then he, he kisses her and then realizes that there's no emotion. Right. And, you know, and the look she has at him is, is un, you know, no violence, nobody dies, no blood, but it, you know, it's like the loss of a soul. Yeah. And to me, that's that, a great, that great look thing. that she gives him and his response when he realizes that she now is one of the pod people uh, is absolutely terrifying. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great scene. And again, that's just the actors in a cave up in Bronson Canyon, I think is where they filmed in L.A., if you know L.A. at all. But everything, you know, and they were going, they were filming at breakneck speed. And, you know, it was a, I don't know what the budget for the film was, but, it, you know, it wasn't very high. So, they were absolutely the bare essentials. And with all of that, it's one of the greatest scenes in movie them. Well, you know, you, you can't you can't put a price tag on imagination. Exactly. Exactly. And and this was uh, was was certainly that. You know, and there's a, a lot of other features about this. Um Carolyn Jones is in the uh, was in the film and she goes on yep. to become famous as Mort- Morticia in the Adams Family TV series. That's right. A number That's of years right. later. Mm-hmm. And uh, Kevin is also in another, uh, not quite on the same level, but still another science fiction classic is Piranha. Oh, and, uh, yes. He, that he's was in his... that. And Barbara Steele is, you know, who's one of the most famous um, female actors in, in these kind of films. She's in that as well. And Roger, it's a Roger Corman film, and again, kind of like B picture, but it's good. It's it's good. It's and again, it's really scary. <laughs> I haven't seen it in in years, and but 
I remember when he did it, and that was his start with uh, his affiliation with Joe Dante, who became oh, yeah. a very good friend. He's a great guy. But that was the first film he did for a very young Joe Dante, and that was in the very late 70s. I'm trying to remember. I think it was before we were married. We were married in 79. So maybe it was 78, something like that. Yeah, it was, and it's a Roger Corman produced film, you know, so it fit. Exactly. <laughs> and we got, it was so nice that Kevin did that film because we got invited to the Locarno Film Festival, um, did a whole big, uh, their two weeks, or however long it was, I think it was two weeks, centered on Roger Corman films. They were honoring Roger Corman, and it was just wonderful, wonderful to do that. And to have so many other actors who had worked with Roger Corman and to really get to know him a little bit, it's quite a character. Well, there was all kinds so, of people who went on to so-called famous careers who started off with Roger Corman, you know, Robert oh, Niro yeah. and Jack Nicholson. And, Jack you know, Nicholson, yeah. Francis Ford Coppola, online you can go. Mm -hmm. and Joe Dante, as you mentioned here. Uh, yep. Yeah, he, he was the, uh, the, the figure who gave birth to uh, all kinds of... Uh, sci-fi horror uh, exactly began with him well uh kate this has been delightful uh talking yeah about, is there any special memory or any special uh thought you kind of want to maybe share with before we uh, we're we're going to sign off here in a few minutes but um okay uh anything special that you want to share or or that you know that you remember about kevin or any of the or any of these other things here well, I think I told you this story the other day when we spoke. Um, one of my very dear memories of Kevin is he, Kevin, I was always sending him out to do things. He was my little errand boy. But often enough, I would say, can you run to the market and get this, this, and this? I was the cook in the family. And he was the eater. <laughs> So he didn't mind doing these errands. And he ran into somebody in Gelson's, which is a popular supermarket in L.A. And um, that person knew Donna Winter's son, Mark, mm. um, and got Kevin's number and, and called Mark up. And Mark called Kevin. And through all of this, meeting somebody in a supermarket... Kevin was able to get in touch with Donna Winter, who was living, and by the way, that's how she pronounces her name. It's not Dana. It's Donna. Okay. And Thank you for she, that. <laughs> yeah. Well, she she grew up in what was then Rhodesia, um, mm. and so she has something of a, you know, a sort of British South African um, kind of accent. Um, anyway... So he called her up. She was living in Ireland at the time and the phone rang and she answered it. And he said, Becky, it's miles. <laughs> 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 and she became a very, very dear friend. She Shortly after that, she moved to, oh, what's the name of that town? It's just north of L.A., um, it's where they have the big music festival every year. It'll come to me. But um, we visited her in Ireland, and her son became a good friend. Um, she has a most adorable cottage, thatched roof, looking out over just spectacular scenery. So uh, that was really, really wonderful that you know, towards the end of their lives, they became friends, and I got in on it. Lucky me. Oh, that's that's so. a great story. Yeah. All right. Well, it mm -hmm. uh, our time is just about up, but it's been great having this chance to just talk a little bit yeah, with you, Kate. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, and uh, I'm I'm ready now to watch the film again. <laughs> right? Me too. Me <laughs> right. too. And if you ever can see it on the big screen, it's really extraordinary. 
it's it's just a different animal. It was it was fun yeah, to get I, to I think I, do I that. did see it on it on the big screen. If I'm not, I'm not 100 sure, but I think I did. Um, when I was I was in taking film classes in uh, New York City in the late seventies, the same period we're talking about here. Okay. And, and mm -hmm. you got, you know, back in the days when they had before they had videos, and you'd have right. these re revival theaters that would show these classic films on a big mm -hmm. screen. You know, the failure, mm -hmm. which is immortalized in Annie Hall and uh, a bunch of others, yep. a bunch of others down in the village. And I right. think I may have seen it back in that in that era. But mm -hmm. um, just uh, just great, great stuff. So, well, listen, uh, Kate, we just wish you all the best. We thank you so thank much you. for taking the time sure. to talk with us here. Good. How old do you think well, you were when you first saw this, Gwendolyn? Hmm, I would say, I feel like I was in middle school when I first saw this, but I definitely remember the scene when all of a sudden she's taken over, the one you described. That kind right. of, I think that's with you when you first see it. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a shock, too, because you've been rooting for Becky and, you know, they're partners and you want them to get out and be able to be together. Yeah, you think they're um, heroin, they're heroin, they're going to have to survive and they don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I feel like yeah. the fact that she only closes her eyes for that split second and it's mm. enough to be taken over, that was so scary to me. Sure. I wonder if it's prompted insomnia people <laughs> uh, I could well do that yeah uh, oh by the way can I mention one more thing please. in the film in the film also another one of the players was Larry Gate um, who seems to come along in Kevin's life at critical moments um, Larry Gates got him involved in the theater at the University of Minnesota way back when. Um, so perhaps, but for Larry Gate, Kevin wouldn't have gotten into acting. And then Larry Gates was it also in this play where I saw Kevin, Poor Murderer, that was so, you know, deeply meaningful to me. And I'll tell you one last thing. After we were married, I was moving a box into uh, Kevin's apartment from my apartment, and out falls a letter. And Kevin looked at it and said, can I open this? And I said, sure. And it was a letter from me to my parents from camp. I was about 12 years old, and that night we had seen... Um, death of a salesman and I was so moved and so upset I distinctly remember hiding in my sleeping bag with my with my flashlight and and uh writing my parents about the experience and it you know it's just incredible Kevin and I looked at each other as though wow this is spooky <laughs> this was meant to be well so uh, being a Presbyterian minister, I, I believe the Lord's hand is uh, in far more than we suspect. <laughs> well, you may be right. All right. So, Good talking to you. Yeah, it was wonderful talking with you, Kate. Thank you so much. And uh, again, sure. this is Paul, uh, and this is 10 Times the Terror. And we're signing off now, and I uh, hope you join us the next time. So everybody, take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you for listening to It's Ten Times the Terror The Podcast One of my favorite films ever <laughs> <laughs> Let's do that for again Thank you for listening to Ten Times the Terror This podcast would not be possible Without listeners like you You can find out more about our podcast By visiting our website TenTimesTheTerror.com That's TenXTheTerror.com